It's very important that we seek to understand the Cambodian genocide because in several very important ways it challenges our perception, our notions of what genocide is. Most notably, our conception of how perpetrators define the other. We're very pleased to welcome Dr. Song Tan to this lecture series. Dr. Tan is a survivor of Cambodia's killing fields. He spent time in the forced labor camps of the Khmer Rouge, culminating in a perilous escape on foot to the refugee camps along the Thai border. After a six-year ordeal, he was resettled in San Francisco, where he worked as a health worker and interpreter. Dr. Tan has been a pediatrician in Long Beach since the 80s. He's the president and the co-founder of the Cambodian Health Professionals Association of America. This organization focuses on global health and they conduct an annual mission to provide free medical, surgical, and dental care to the underprivileged people of Cambodia. They also offer medical education to local volunteers. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tan here today to tell us of his experience of the Cambodian genocide. Dr. Tan. Thank you, Dr. Diane Panis, for your introduction. Thank you for inviting me here tonight. And thank you for my friend, Dr. Grandwald, for uh, connecting me to Dr. Panis here today. I'm delighted here to be, to be here today. And this is like a deja vu. I've been here before, in 1981, but I forgot about it. You know, after I arrived in San Francisco, actually I set foot in Hamilton Air Force Base in Moran County and I fall in love with Moran County but I have no chance to live here, it's so beautiful. So I live in San Francisco and work there for uh, one and a half years before awaiting my credential to be recognized and then I went on to my residency in Hawaii and then set up my new life. So I have so much so much connection and so much in love with this, the Northern California, but I now live in Southern California. My only disclaimer tonight is that you know, disclaimer, I disclose that I have no anything else, no expertise in genocide except to tell you my story, my experiences, living through the genocide, how it's like to be live in that period of time. During that time, I was a 26 years old intern in a hospital. You know, you can say mature, mature age. Now you can have speaker who already uh, some already or elderly and a lot of young kids don't even know about the event uh, the events that happening or some younger speaker at that time probably in a teen or in a you know infancy period okay so just put you in a perspective that's how my perception at that time and how I experienced my experience and influenced my perception so this is uh, personal, I was invited, but I'm a little bit busy, come out from my mission. I just arrived uh, two or three weeks ago and I had to prepare this. I was not able to do it. So I said, wow, this is a obligation, personal obligation. I have to do it to, uh, you know, actually to tell the story, okay, story about the genocide so that the younger generation can learn about it. It has been 41 years now. Last year we've marked the 40 years anniversary of the genocide, the start of the genocide. So this year is 41, first year, April 17. So a little bit just caps, uh, caps, uh, capsulize a little bit. The Khmer Rouge took over uh, the country in uh, 1975, April 17. And that term is very important because people uh, recognize it and they tell us the people that they torture, they said the people of April 17, that means the people that they liberated and they subjugated to uh, this kind of tortures. The Khmer Rouge was all thrown, the rain is like three years, eight months, 20 days until January 7, 1979. And during that period of time, over 1.7 million people the statistics vary from 1.5 to 2 point plus million, so a lot of people uh, settled with 1.7 million people died during that period of time. 
you have to recognize that so many other people died before that war, before that period, and during the, uh, the, the evacuation. And the end was uh, the country went into peace only in 1998 when the Khmer Rouge political military structure was dismantled. A uh, little bit about geography, Cambodia is located at Southeast Asia. Uh, the capital is Phnom Penh. You see capital Phnom Penh here. The, this is talk about divided into provinces. The border is Lao, Laos. And Naomi just we visited last year Thailand in the west and Vietnam and the Gulf of Siam or of Thailand in that period. You see the Koh Rong is famous for what this Koh Rong? It's famous for survival. Se season last season and this season uh, is take place here, survival. <laughs> <laughs> and the iconic landmark is uh, Uncle Wat. Anybody need to see before they die? <laughs> That's what they say. Okay, Uncle Wat Temple. Southeast Asia now is constituted of 10 nations. Uh, Cambodia's part of it, Singapore, Indonesia, you have uh, Philippines, you have Laos, Vietnam, and Malaysia. Uh, that's the ASEAN country. The leader just invited by Obama was uh, two weeks ago in Sutherland, in, uh, in Southern California. They have a meet, summit there. Okay. And the Cambodian population fact, almost, I think it's past, past 50 million pe people now. The, large, the language is Khmer, the Khmer language. Okay, you see a large translation thing, uh, on a, some material in the state. Uh, religion is Buddhism. Buddhism is divided by three branches of Buddhism. You have Theravada, you have Mayana, and Vrayava, Vrayana. If you are, you know, in the Buddhism, Theravada is uh, called Hinayana also, or Little Vehicle, is practiced in Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Thailand is the same Buddhism, Burma or Myanmar, and Sri Lanka. And uh, the other two is Mahayana. Mahayana is practiced by the Chinese, Korean, Japanese, and Vietnamese, and Vrayana is the Tibetan Buddhism. The government is constitutional monarchy and the prince king is Sihanouk and the prime minister is Hun Sen. Cambodia recent history is divided, uh, the recent one, the Angkor, Pier, Angkor, Angkor Empire. There's uh, a chapter, there's so much talk about Angkor, you have to visit Angkor Wat to learn all. But the recent one is from 1863 to 1953. The French came and uh, like a, take Cambodia and Southeast Asia like a colony, and Cambodia was uh, uh, under the French protectorate. Cambodia gained independence in November 9, 1953, and was under uh, Kingdom of Cambodia the name, and the chief of state at that time was Sihanouk, Norodom Sihanouk. In 1970, 18 March of 1970, uh, the monarchy was overthrown by, uh, his name is Lono, later I'm going like, to talk a little bit, and uh, Sirimata, and that went into war. And 75 culminated in the establishment of the democratic uh, Kampuchea, which is Khmer Rouge. And 1979 to 1993 is uh, the regime that's under the Vietnamese control and Hun San at that time. and. The first ever United Nations, uh, they call P uh, Peace Accord, broker by United Nations, was signed in October 1991 between the faction. And currently, the government is the Kingdom of Cambodia after the election. And now it's like a, a parliamentary system with monarchy, constitutional monarchy. At that time, during the the Sihanouk reign, at this time, this time actually, there was a little bit of kind of peaceful uh, prosperity in Cambodia. Phnom Penh was known as like the pearl of uh, Paris, like Paris in uh, in the east, and Cambodia enjoyed a, a peaceful. Uh, time, period of time, whereas Vietnam was planned into war in Vietnam. Those of you old enough to know the war in Vietnam, 
trigger a lot of manifestation, demonstration in, in America because it was drafted. It affect everybody. Not unlike the war in uh, recent war in Iraq, Afghanistan, only the volunteer army went into. At that time, people at come of age had to be drafted. I was not here, but you know, people demonstrated, right? People know had to be lottery, thing like that. And Sihanouk was the king, he crowned it as a king in, when he was only in the teen, 18 years old. That's him. Just a little bit leading up to the Khmer Rouge. Recently, have you heard Bernie Sanders talk about Cambodian American bombing in America, in Cambodia, being responsible for the slaughter of the Khmer Rouge genocide? A little bit very controversial during the debate with Hillary Clinton three weeks ago. In 1970, after the coup d'etat, Nixon ordered intense bombing in Cambodia with Henry Kissinger. In the front line, you see all this hot spot was bombing. The United Nations dropped upward of 2.7 million tons of bomb in Cambodia, exceeding the amount on Japan. You understand 30% of the country population was displaced. The Khmer Rouge at that time, very controversial, but at that time, I have to tell that Henry Kissinger, he gained the Peace Prize in 1973. And here, as a youngster, you know, at that time, 1970, there was a demonstration and resulting in four deaths, a six student shot at Kent State University and Jackson State University with a demonstration against that operation, the uh, secret bombing in, Cam in Cambodia. U.S. bomb communist Vietnamese century and supply line. The reason the American bomb, because I think Kissinger, he has some justification in his books. And I think it's not that inaccurate because uh, during, that, during the period of time, Cambodia and the Prince Sihanouk play a double uh, role in Cambodia. Vietnam need to, uh, to bring uh, uh, arms and supply ammunition to South Vietnam and they cannot cross the demilitarized, demilitarized zone because American bomb so much. So they use the American, uh, use Cambodian and Laos territory, they call the Ho Chi Minh Trails and violate Cambodian neutrality in the war. You know, and Cambodia just let it go. And sometimes, I, when I was young, I heard peop, uh, the Chinese or the USSR supply arms through the port, and they just bring it to Cambodia. And uh, that bring, and the Vietnamese fought, the North Vietnamese fought the war, and they came to sixth century in Cambodia to rest, resupply, and go back to attack the American troops. So, uh, the American had no choice at that time, if you want to say that justification, because I had no choice, I had to bomb the supply route. For, at that time, in 1970, as you see in the timeline, 70, Lonol and Sir Mata, the prince is a cousin of Sihanouk, mounted a coup d'etat while Sihanouk was not in the country. Sihanouk was in travel to Russia. During that, his absence, this, Knowing that the country was in trouble, he said we need to overthrow him. But by overthrowing with the tacit approval of the American CIA, so overthrow the country and plunge the country into war. During the 1970, the demonstration, um, the sentiment in America is against against the war in Vietnam. They just want to withdraw. I think during the campaign 1968, Nixon said we're gonna have to withdraw. From, they want to find a way out from Vietnam because in the quick mind at that time, they need to get out, but how to do it? So they negotiate the peace accord. At that time, Cambodia into the war at the end of everybody have the war. And so Cambodia is really bad in bad situation in getting itself into that situation. So the coup d'etat happened. This is a two leader. He's a four star general and he's also, he's a, this is him receiving McCain, the father of Senator McCain. He was a commander of 7th Fleet in, in the Pacific at that time. This is Lenore. During that peace, uh, that time, 70 to 75, early on, Sihanouk, I, I don't have any slide here, Sihanouk was very angry because he was overthrown. So 
he appealed from Mus uh, from Moscow and from Beijing, he thought he didn't want. To, he of course, when he come back, he get be killed. So he broadcast from uh, Beijing and he create a front, United Front. He appealed to the people, say, "You guys have to join me with the Pol Pot, and then to overthrow the London regime." By appealing, he was so popular still. By appealing, the people. Uprise. Actually, the Pol Pot at the time was nothing, just a small group of, of go nowhere. There's no no uh, support. Become so much stronger because of Cyanuk support. Cyanuk role in history might be uh, very controversial as well. Might be condemned by a lot of people because because of his action, the Khmer Rouge get so, so much stronger, and that make it possible to overthrow uh, to get take over the country. So uh, Cyanuk was duped into joining them and later it was discarded like a trash, you know, by them in the Pol Pot. So during that time we suffered so much because the war intensified. The South Vietnam and American with Lon fight against her. No Vietnamese and the Viet Cong fight and the Cameroon alongside. At that time I was youngster, okay, twenty something years old. When they have fight I saw the dead body, they all Vietnamese, not Cambodian. But they fight in the name of the Cambodian, of the Khmer Rouge, on the, on the Khmer, uh, of the of the uh, front, the Sihanouk front, the French Sihanouk. They basically Khmer Rouge and Sihanouk are the same place, the same same time. So they take over the country, one province at a time, one province. There's so many casualties leading up to the war. My family at that time was there's so, so much rocket bombing to the capital. They want to disrupt life everywhere. So my family, actually, for experience, my family in Phnom Penh were, were, were hit by the rocket. Five of our family died that day in 1973. So uh, I was come back from medical school and called to my home, people surround my home. They bombed everywhere at that time. So many just scattered everywhere in that village, you know, near the stadium. And uh, my family, like that, just slaughtered. My medical school also was attacked, was bombed everywhere. You just live under the bomb. There's no, uh, uh, don't, uh, no shield, nothing. You just live like that, according to fate. Okay. So there's so many chaos, so many death, and that's not even counted during that time. So many refugees who come to the capital because the countryside was taking over. And at that time, report always say, actually, when I was young, I didn't know what happened in the other side of the country until I listened to the Voice of America. The news, American news, NBC, ABC, they cover, they have their team to go to cover the, the place. I didn't uh, venture, I did not venture outside anywhere. We just live at home and go to school and go as business. The country was shrinking. The colonial government was defeated because American support was dwindling and uh, their force getting stronger because of the support of the Vietnamese, uh, the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong. As you know, the trend went uh, upward uh, to, uh, against uh, the London government and the American forces. So I heard rumor that they practice of Pol Pot. Every time they take a city, they evacuate all the, the problem, they evacuate the city. They evacuate them like that. So oh, what happened? Oh, maybe they evacuate them, they want the population. It's a struggle for population. I didn't realize. That's how they practice. When they take over the country, they evacuate from Penn as well. And that's a pattern we didn't realize it. A lesson to be learned. A lot of us would have survived or just left, fled the country a long time ago. But we did not. Okay, so the, that's a lesson and a lot of us make a mistake to stay on. And that's how, let's go. In 1975, April 2, Desperate, Americans know there's no way they are approaching, the troops approaching. The American embassy and the policies evacuate the people. They work with the American, like journalists. You see the killing field. That guy, that prawn, was offered to go that day. The prawn, the one that played in the killing field, to offer to go with Sandberg. Sandberg leave, but he, no, Sandberg stayed there as well. Sandberg, which is a New York Times journalist, and the Cambodian uh, helpers, he offered the Cambodian to leave that time by see the evacuate. 
the Marines outside there evacuate the people, the Cambodian who actually be Cambodian because they know they're going to be slaughtered after they come. Just like anybody who have some connection with the American would be slaughtered. So uh, that problem did not leave. So at that time there was fire, fighting everywhere in the compound of the embassy. That was April 13. Four days later, the, the capital was taken. The people would gather to see the Marine evacuating Phnom Penh. This is the last ambassador to Phnom Penh, his name John Gunther Dean. He lives in Paris now. Recently, he was interviewed and he really bitter about this and he came to Thailand. He said, United States abandoned Cambodia and handed it over to the butcher during the pullout 40 years ago at the anniversary. And another foreign minister, he lives in Long Beach right now, he's ill. We in, Cambo in Cambodia have been seduced and abandoned. And he said, because he at that time was promised that Cam American gonna, you know, the Nixon administration, but he, he, he's, he just fought against the tie of the opinion, public opinion, American opinion with the title of the war. And the morning of the evacuation, Dean said his office and he read the letter of Sir Mata. This letter signed by him, who was this, Lonnal already left Cambodia a few, a few months earlier to Hawaii and then California, he passed away in California. But him, he was there, Sir Mata, Prince Sir Mata, he was uh, asked to leave, to be evacuated, but he said, Dear Excellency and friend, I thank you sincerely for your letter and your offer to transport me towards freedom. I cannot, alas, live in such cowardly fashion. As you know, in particular for your great country, I never believed for a moment that you would have this sentiment abandon a people which has chosen liberty. You have refused us your protection and we can do nothing about it. You live and my wish is that you and your country will find happiness under this sky. Mark Marie, well, if I shall die here on the spot in my country that I love is too bad because we all were born and must die one day. I have committed this may of blame you, Americans. So he died. He died. Bravely. People respect him a lot. A lot of government officers who stay on was all slaughtered. I heard they all buried them like that and just bulldozed them. The way the Khmer Rouge killed the people are so cruel, you never would believe it. So the tank was moved in before, at that time, that day before the Khmer Rouge came to power. Here's some of the scene of the day of the infamy in, my, in the life of Cambodia. The troops came, the people would wave the white flag. And we're some very happy. He, at that time, he laid it that the country at last were going to be at, at peace. The country were at peace. They just bring it over. I have to tell you, that night I was on call in the hospital. I was reported to duty as a good intern, went to the hospital that some people did not go. But I left my family and to be on call like tonight. And that's on the 16th. So tomorrow, 17th, the fall. That night there were so many shelling, so many bomb, everything. There are so many injuries, you can imagine. And the next day, they came. We thought, oh, the war is over. We're going to go live in a communist country. It's okay. That's fate. You would not believe that they would, a few minutes later or a few hours later, they say everybody had to leave the, the city, even in hours or days. So. We had to pack. I tried to go back to my family. I cannot leave because they would not let me go to the other side of the city. So I was separate from my parents, my sisters, on the whole extended family from then on. And they all died. And uh, I never seen them again. See, that day, the hospital was full of, uh, like I said, injury. And you know what happened that day? I couldn't believe it. The city was evacuated, everybody evacuated. There's so many scenes that you can see in the movie, they enacted so many scenes. Some, I just, you can go internet, you can see some of the scenes move, the newsreels. But I have to tell you, I saw people just walking slowly, okay? One or two million people walking out. Uh, evacu mass evacuation without any provision of organized supply of food, water, 
or sanitation or anything like that. You just walk and you know, only five, five auto route or five highway go out from the city. You walk from the high highway and uh, how slow you're gonna be. And there's no, nothing. You have to carry your stuff. And some people drive the car, but the car would run out of gas and they would confiscate their, or anything they confiscate, you say, just walk your, your foot. And uh, people die just on the street. I see people abandoning their elderly parents. In the hospital, I look in the hospital, they would have to go out with the bed, IV. The hospital would stop operation uh, on the spot. Uh, that's in the hospital. You just being operated, you die. No care. You are sick, you die. Nothing. The country turned into year zero. You know, in the scene, I was in Calmet Hospital, the Calmet the French hospital in Phnom Penh. Uh, nowadays, it's a big and the most modern hospital in Phnom Penh. I was in the hospital. They keep us for 20 days. Nobody, you know, only us, a few of us know. And next door is the French embassy, where the killing field, the, one of the scenes take place. The killing field where Schenberg, all this, try to make up those uh, ID card, things like that. So I see people just walk days and days and people go to supply line to supply the hospital. They went to all the uh, neighborhood. They saw people piling, body piling. They told us, oh my God, no good, no good. So many slaughter around, so mass murder around the capital. They saw us, anybody look like a soldier, they shut, shut down on the spot. The first way is soldiers and government officer. You soldier and government officer die right away, on the spot, without question. And then the second wave is educated people. Any part is rich and educated people. And at that time, a lot of people still carrying a lot of money. Didn't know what happened. The money would be million and the money would not worth it, like paper after that. You know, the Khmer Rouge would not use any money, okay? And I say, oh, the year zero, because when they get out, how to make fire? There's no lighter, no matches. So people just make stone, just like you go camping, okay? So make fire to cook. I said, this is done, we're done. And no medical care, or no infrastructure, nothing. School are closed, hospital closed. The country turned back, educated people are being decimated. decimated. What kind of country is that? Even uh, the communist China, the communist Russia, they would keep the scientists, the doctors to use, right, for producing their mass weapon or anything like that. They would not. These people just kill them. I don't know their paranoia, their justification is an enigma to us. Nowadays, why would they do all this stuff? So people just walk, evacuate. It was estimated like at least 100, 200,000 people died. Cholera was rampant. I saw cholera. At that time, of course, mass evacuation, no sanitation, and it's in April. If you know Cambodia, Southeast Asia in April is the hardest month of the year. 105, 10 plus temperature. So this, uh, this is be a perfect storm for disaster at that time. And they would just walk, let you walk to the countryside without provision, anything. You just have to survive by yourself. So I say, my family, I don't know what happened to them, but myself, I said, we have to carry something, one or two clothes. Um, for me, I said, the most important is a mos mosquito net. And water, you just find on the way, on the way, and some provision of food, and no medicine. But I was young. So elderly people, you are condemned to die. People left the elderly people there because they cannot carry them. And I don't know how much suffering before they die, okay? You cannot walk, you're done. Just like in the jungle, done. Did you left over, people don't care. So I have no heart, but everybody take care of themselves. So the killing field started. During the Pol Pot, like I said, the first way is killing all the soldiers, the government for revenge, the government officer for their torture, the high, higher class, the bourgeoisie class, 
because your resentment, they think the oppressor of the society. The only friend of them is peasant farmers that they distinguish three of classes of farmers: the high class, the rich farmers, the lower. Only the lower are spared. Okay, anybody have a third education? Uh, primary education, elementary education is fine. Secondary education, you consider as educated. So you would spread into the village. I would be evacuated. I walked many, many, many weeks. I think two or three months, I think. And then I finally you settle in a village. I would settle in, if the map earlier, in uh, Krochet province, where we settle I, along the Mekong River. I would consider it as lucky because Mekong River uh, you don't have malaria. Some people a little bit sero, a little bit inside. You force and your fate. They say you have to be there, you'll be there. That's it. No argument, no discussion, no bargaining. Okay, you be there, your fate is sealed. Some people being uh, put in the settlement inside the country a little bit far from the Mekong mirror. They all I witness infested by malaria, they all die. Just one village, 1,000 people, probably 10% survive. Malaria, I saw them, malaria falciparum, they died just in front of me, two or three people. Those are, they have a black water, uh, kidney fever, falciparum. And uh, no water, no uh, food. Second way of people who die is disease, starvation. And also, if you, for example, you have anything reminiscent of you just stay or against them anything they just kill you on the spot they are the charge there are no charge they are the policemen they are the charge they are executioner one person they can act in that role they just take you and that's it no discussion no high authority no charge nothing they just kill you like that just also in the Pol Pot area there's a you're gonna see in the some later I talk about a little bit on the trial, the General Side Tribunal in Cambodia which is undergoing now. There's some forced marriage. I was forced into marriage also. My age, you know. They I don't know for some reason they want to force people to marry. If you don't obey them and you uh, go against them, you die <laughs> that time too. There's a lot of testimony about forced marriage as well. That's one of the practice I never know that existed in any, any example in the past. So basically in the countryside when you live there, you just fall into labor in a commune. You go, they organize labor by their brigade. You go to work and come back to eat like hundreds of thousands of people together. They assign a cook. So the ration is so small, you would be hungry, a small gruel and then you go to work and year 1975, 76, 78 all getting less and less and people die of diseases of course salvation and diseases over work disease there's no medical care there's no doctor they took all these young girls 15, 16 and they trained them how to do doctors barefoot doctor copy from China you know, barefoot doctor. These doctors would know nothing about medicine. And you know, uh, the only thing we saw, all we talk about is that they put a medicine, the quinine for malaria. They put med medicine like that, and they with a plastic bag, and they put their serine, and still, <laughs> not still at all. They inject in the people. And you know, some malaria can be cured by itself, like the, they call malaria. Passive uh, vivax, which is a cyclical, you can get into remission, thing like that. And some people just suffer from abscess, so many abscess and die of abscess instead of dying of the diseases. So, beside mass murder, starvation, diseases, you also die of exhaustion and during that time, a lot of persecution against the Jam, the Muslim people. There's a small percentage of Muslim people in Cambodia as well, which is on trial right now. And of course, the ethnic Vietnamese is also on trial. So during that time, as you see, uh, the skull display, you can see some of the places if you visit Cambodia, you can see some excavation. This is some horrific thing. 
Yeah. One of the places they go, like Naomi went there. This is, uh, this is a mass uh, forced labor. During the rainy season, you would go to plant rice, things like that. But in the dry season, which is run from December to May, to May, you were forced to go to the uh, remote area to build dam and dike. And you see all some clip in the movie or some news. You see people like that. This is not really clear. People just carry, carry like that. That's what we did. Carry dirt, dig dirt, and fill it. And I heard all this dike and dam later were all destroyed by flood. The reason is for design. They are not educated, you know. People say these people are not leaders. They are, they just peasant, have no education. How can they build this? They lead us to build something that is not gonna last. They don't know the geography very well. The train. They are not educated. They are not engineer. So that's a problem. And here the mastermind of the murder, Pol Pot. He was educated in France. He went to France. Sihanouk used to say. Oh, I'd rather have my student go to China than France or Russia. When they go to China and Russia, they come back, they're against communism. When they come back from France, they all idealize and become communists. And, it's, and he idealized it and come, they want to set up an uh, utopian society in Cambodia where the country would be equal, everybody the same. But the equality is not lift up everybody to be equal, but to put it down. One of the examples is that on the countryside, when we were there, the big houses, they would destroy the big houses and build smaller one. Destroy the bigger house too, because you are too bourgeois. The bigger one had to destroy, had to be destroyed, had to build smaller one to be small heart. So everybody had to bring, bring back to the low, lower end. Here some of the, and the soldiers, I'm so scared of these people. I know, I mean, look, they have to look in their eyes because they are cruel, they are very, they are young. They are ch children and they took them as the soldiers and when they rule us, they are ruthless. You know, kids are very easy to influence, right? Very easy to, to educate, to brainwash them and tell them what to do. The country was... Okay, here's one of some of the rule of Onka. Onka, that means the organization. They would not tell them as a communist party. They call the organization called Onka. Onka, which is organization. Anything, report everything to the Onka. That means, as a citizen, you have duty to report any activities. For example, the background. Some people hide their background. If you know, they sometimes talk between their friends, say that, oh, you, in an old society, you are, have a car, thing like that, and you report, oh, yeah, that guy have a car, he must be a rich person. So that night, he disappeared. Okay? So some kids don't know their parents, brag about, oh, my dad said he have a car or something. Oh, my dad was in the army, like that, done. That night, done. Okay? And secretly observe any slide. If you sing a song, reminiscent of the society, of the good old time, you're dead also. Okay, so this is stick to the four principles, do not know, pretend not to know anything. You see somebody do something, you do not know, not to hear, not to see, and not to speak to your own risk. And the Anka, they said, everybody spy on each other, just like the communist system. So have eyes of a pineapple. You have to love the Anka. The Anka is the mother and father of the young children. If you have your children, when they're young, they took away to be looked after. The parents had to go to work, they are not live together. And they said, if you are uh, your, your parent, you have to be faithful, loyal to your, to your Anka, to your organization, than to your parents. That means, if anything, suspicious of your parent, you report it. And that make the family, destroy the family. This is their onka. I just have to go over that during the time we suffer. You know, I wish Americans come to bomb the second, third world war. I say, I don't care, my life is short, my life done. You know, at that time there was no hope. You know, you, I always think you are better off in a prison because you know your term going to be five years, three years. You in the Pol Pot at that time, I said, done, you have nothing. Some uh, committed suicide. Actually, some of my friends, because there's no hope. 
you don't see that the end is going to be at the end of the tunnel, the lights at the end of the tunnel. So hope is one of the community that you have. You are in the prison, you have hope, so okay, the days are counted, but there's no hope. But during that time that we suffer, a lot of story that will come out from Cambodia was not believed by the, the people outside of Cambodia. There was a two, two books. Okay, one is uh, the gentleman. When I came out to refugee camp, I learned all this stuff by John Barron, Anthony Paul. He published in the Digest magazine, Read the Digest, very famous, in retelling the atrocity committed by the Pol Pot. And that was the first time the Western world, the whole world, realized what happened in Cambodia. Another book is by this French priest. He lived in Cambodia, with Khmer, and he's. Uh, also, he, year, he wrote the year zero. I will mention year zero, the year that uh, Cambodia put back to medieval age. But a lot of people didn't believe it. And one of them is Noam Chomsky. He's very, uh, MIT, very, very respected. Chomsky and Herman. But we have to say what we, we think they're real. Much of the posturing by economics and things like that is largely usually because of the opposition to the war in Vietnam. When they, something happened as bad as in Cambodia, they validated, uh, not validated people that uh, uh, was for the war and uh, was uh, discredited to the anti-war movement. So that's why uh, now Chomsky and Herman published in the article in the Nation saying that failure of the American effort to subdue South Vietnam and to crush the mass movement in Indochina. Now a ca there was a campaign to reconstruct the history. They think they reconstruct the history. So as to place the role of the U.S. in a more favorable light. The rewriting of the history uh, by the established press was say, uh, so well by the terror company atrocity which not only proved the evil of the communism, but undermine the credibility of those opposed to war. At that time, there was a movement, strong movement of anti-war, Vietnam War. So they want to validate that it's not happening, but it's not true. Both claim that they have not no massacre. They laid the blame on the tragedy of Khmer Rouge on the American bombing. They accused the, uh, these people of being insufficiently critical of our account, the refugee account, which has which all proven to be truth. Okay, they read the best, they have an argument on their reasoning that something seems to impossible in their personal logic, then it doesn't exist. Everything the Pol Pot did defies logic. Like I said before, how can they de destroy and kill all the educated people in Cambodia and to expect the country to, to be uh, rebuilt? And doesn't it make sense, and that's why it's intriguing, and it's, it do a lot of us to stay in the country and almost die, and a lot of us die, our family. He now to document this thing. When you go to visit Cambodia, uh, Naomi saw there's a tour slang genocide museum. In the early month of the regime, they they killed these people. Actually, this museum not for the common people. In the beginning, it's for officer. And that the cadres, the cadre, Kameru cadre, actually, they killed not us. We actually, I didn't know anything. We are in the countryside, remote in the countryside. This is in the city of Phnom Penh, near my home, actually. They, they call Tu Slang. It's a high school, Kaisu. Uh, and then they make it as a, a prison to, for, of torture. So a lot of people will be uh, being, uh, write confession and being tortured and brought. This is the museum that sometimes you brought to see them early on. This picture, some of my classmates was there, was there, educated. I have to tell you also, at that time, during the 70s, during the uh, Lon Nol regime, a lot of foreign students, Cambodian medical uh, students, there's not so many in America, but in France. There's a lot of support to the Khmer Rouge because, you know, Lon Nol government and the whole government were very corrupt and, you know, the idealistic student support uh, the Khmer Rouge. Some of my friends in from uh, they 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 was in France during the takeover. But after that, they applied to come back to Cambodia. They want to come to help rebuild the country. They apply and come to Beijing and come to Cambodia. 
And you know what happened to these people? All of them are, were in prison and some of them were killed. They would not spare them. Even this strong support of them in Paris that demonstrate against, uh, for them, fought for them, argued for them, they killed them because they're suspicious of them being a CIA agent. That's demonstrate how paranoia uh, these people are. These people are educated. They're all the crop of the crop and they kill all of them, okay, in two slang. And they make confession. Can, after they died, they took to this center, genocide center, Jing Aik, you know, where we brought you on the Jing Aik, where Jing Aik genocide center is located about 70 kilometers of Phnom Penh. It's a field uh, before, it's a Chinese graveyard and converted to a field, killing field. If you go there, you see a lot of uh, hole, okay? Genocide. You go to Cambodia, you see that probably up to 20,000 victims, diplomat, foreigner. There's foreigner too. Nine European were killed there, okay? That's the place, mass grave. Even the kid, they killed there against which executioner beat the children over here with the children, you see them. A lot of uh, things that now I'm just talk about after the Pol Pot. There's a movie called Enemy of the People. It's a new documentary. He's now at Harvard, Ted Sambat. He talk about, he interviewed, he took so many years to interview brother number two, the second to Pol Pot. He was on trial, he's now on trial. And if he's convicted, actually, and it took many years. This summer clip, you can go Google, you can, you know, YouTube, some of YouTube. This is two murder. This in the movie, he show how they kill people like this. One of the people, the Khmer Rouge kill people not just like that. Sometimes they kill. Like in my village, they took me, uh, my or my friend. One day, I survived. Why people ask me why I survive? You know, during my uh, the area, they took some of my friend that day. They took some of my friend away, and I said, "Why don't you have my name? Why I'm not taking away?" I said, "I ask." They say, "Oh, I don't see your list. They miss me. I was some places. They miss me, my name, and it's because of they missing my name, and I survive. That's only by that." And said, so "I asked them why don't you take me also because I didn't know." what happened. They say, oh, don't worry, next time, okay? But well, all my friends were taken away, were taken away, and they all died. And the way they died, they told me later, the tale told me. They just put in a mountain and a cliff like that, and bind in them, and just just pull, push them. And they just died like that, on the mountain. It's just eaten by animal like that, and I was spared. A lot of things you didn't know at the time until later, people tell you what happened. This is Nguyen Chia, the number, brother number two, during the clip. So during the, uh, the legacy of the Pol Pot regime, we have year zero, we have 1.7 million people who die, and you have a lot of my in the country, the higher percentage of my amputees, uh, you have injured and uh, killed. My accident happened every year, every two and a half days, and because of the uh, physician uh, for human rights report in 1997, uh, in 1991, it resulted in the my uh, ban treaty in Oslo, signed because of the physician with uh, for human rights report. You can Google that book, uh, that report. It's the first time they have that report and the impact of my landmine. Why there are so many landmines? Because the uh, Khmer Rouge are uh, uh, afraid that people would escape to Thailand, to Vietnam. They litter the area of landmine so that people cannot escape, cannot go out of the country. They just afraid. Landmine still, uh, and ordnance, unexploded ordnance, they litter everywhere in Cambodia. Actually, my son is working in that area in Cambodia right now for the mining. And they just found this in the Mekong River, also because ammunition was brought in and the, the boat carrying it was sunk by the Khmer Rouge, or the, and then it was in the bottom of the uh, Mekong River. It's literally everywhere in Mekong River, beside landmine. So that's forced, after the Pol Pot, we forced to come to a refugee camp. 
Here we talk about some life in Kaodang. Those of you here, sometimes you been to the refugee camp. I was one of the refugee camp in Thailand. They give, would give you a number. This is in Kaodang where the movie Killing Fear takes place. Here, resulting Cambodia. Cambodia now was in the diaspora in Australia, Canada, America, Europe. We have uh, Cambodian everywhere in America, probably upward of 500 to 700,000 people. Santa Rosa have a small community as well, you know, of Cambodian. So the killing field, in 1982, 83, the killing field came out, 83 I think. And those of you, this is the killing field, the actor, he's uh, my friend. He's, uh, he act, he was casted in Long Beach and he was uh, picked to play the role of uh, the journalist that was, uh, I mentioned earlier, he worked for Sandberg of the New York Times. And he chose to stay, he let his family come to America and resettle in San Francisco. And he stayed, hoping that there's nothing happened. Sandberg was confined to the French embassy. So the French embassy at that time tried and Shenbo tried to get Dirt Prawn. Dirt Prawn is a journalist. He played the role of Dirt Prawn. To come out, but the, America, the French would not let them because afraid of the Khmer Rouge. Any foreigners would be allowed to leave. And America, Cambodian have to, to go out of the embassy and go to the field like everybody else. So Shenbo felt so guilty about being there and had to go through that years. And finally he survived and he came to the VG camp. The movie show him meeting and then they tell his the ordeal in Cambodia. That's the story of the killing field. He won the Oscar yesterday, uh, two days ago. He won the Oscar 1984. Amazing. 84, I think. Amazing. Non-actor. He won over Norita of, character, of the Karate Kid. Norita was de devastated. <laughs> he was not an actor and so yeah, he was devastated. So he's my friend, he went good friend. Okay. There's a few movies actually I'm gonna show you. There's a movie being filmed in Cambodia right now by Angelina Jolie. Later on. First they killed my father. You read the book and know me. This is now there's a seminar going on. I think this one. Uh, this is the movie that now first they killed my being filmed in Cambodia right now, okay? Gonna be a next track. Okay, I jump a little bit. You know, last year there was uh, California State Senate sponsor by one of the Senate State Senator in Long Beach, and the genocide in Memorial Week. In the city of Long Beach also passed the genocide week, commemorating 40 years. Here, Nate Taylor, you should be very interesting. It's a journal for the Far Eastern Economic Review. He's the last one, the first to interview Pol Pot. Here at the city of Long Beach, home the Cambodian town, the Cambodian genocide Venice week last year. We get that, uh, that uh, proclamation. Okay, I think I jump a little bit on this. I want to tell you all this a uh, little bit post, uh, some of the review, book, during that time, the Pol Pot, some of the pictures, Pol Pot in the meeting. Pol Pot, this Yeng Sari, this Hu Nam, some Lai Chia Nuk, Kiu Sam Pan, and this one, I think, Hu Jun. Hu Jun, I think this name is strange to you, but Pol Pot, during his last days in the northern, uh, northwest of Cambodia, he, the final days, he has a kid, he, he married his wife, and his kid become now this girl. He just got married last year, two years ago now. As here, Pop Pot. He died. Nate was there when he died. Nate is very interesting. He interviewed him. It was in Thai couple, Nightline at that time. Nate, he interviewed Pop Pot. Now there's a trial, the Genocide uh, Tribunal, they call it Extraordinary Chamber of the Courts of Cambodia. they funded by the US and um, different country. Okay. The Court of Cambodia prosecuted only two categories of crime between 7th April. 17 and 6 January, senior leaders and also those believed to be the most responsible. They don't want to go through every, every uh, people. Cause number one, Kek Eu, he's the Elian uh, he's a superintendent of the Tuslang Museum. You know, that's why he's an easy target. Case number two is now underway. Kim Sampan is a very educated person. 
uh, his the president of the the the, uh, the, the uh, Cambodia, democratic Cambodia, his uh, figurehead actually he have a thesis in France uh, for his doctrine in economics. I love him when he was in during the Tiananmen regime. The reason is so clean. He's not corrupt. He's an economic. You should be rich. He's so poor. He would not take any bribe. And the kind of person that make him like that, pure like that. But he had that ideology, join Pol Pot. Pol Pot is not as educated as him. He joined him and later he would be killed if he uh, really act against uh, Pol Pot. So he would just stay there to be a figurehead as the president without power, I think. This, this one, uh, this one, Nun Chia, brother number one, have power. He's very powerful, that guy, he's educated in Thailand. He's not French educated. So, Nguyen Chia, this one, he's old, the one that uh, enemy of people. The movie talk about him, interview him. You should watch uh, YouTube about this one. So he was appointed head of state uh, in 1976, he succeeded Pol Pot, but now he's on trial still. He's being arrested and tried. Actually, he's convicted in one count already, but he's still being convicted. You know, the court is going on so long, spend so much money, and I see only convicted two or three people, because some of them already died, they were of age, and also of uh, Alzheimer's, I think. See, Nguyen Chia is still alive, Nguyen Chia, he's known as number two, he studied in Thailand, he, the deputy uh, secretary, he indicted for crime. And Kim Sung Pong, like I said earlier, he's very well beloved uh, before clean, but he still commit crime. And now case number three, four, is not really moving that much. Those are secondary people. Case number four now, again the Cham population, I mean the Muslim, Muslim population, the ethnic Muslim. At that time, this minority were persecuted. Uh, so it's a genocide in the terms of, and also the Vietnamese also. Here's some of the picture of Pol Pot. Some of his level, you see ladies so innocent looking, but he's a butcher. Pol Pot in UAH gives some pawn, some of the level people. Now, there's a documentation center of Cambodia, you can Google. It's founded by Yale, by, uh, by US, by our tax money. Uh, I feel David Yale, documented thousand documents. You want to learn about genocide in Cambodia, that's it. But now, this cannot be replaced by this, uh, this institute. They call Power of Leaves, Slurkrit Institute. When you visit Cambodia next time, when you come, if you want to document this history, study about it, that's it. The permanent home of the largest co collection. And the building is designed by an uh, Iraqi-born person, winning Iraqi, British. Genocide Memorial in Cambodia. That's this lady. And this is going to be the building. This building, beautiful, gonna be, see, this gonna be, it's not yet, it's not open yet, but gonna be beautiful, I, I, okay, so that's all for me, I think, that's, uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs> well, I, have, I have time for questions, I think I, I was asked. All this, I just talk about this uh, Cambodian Association, uh, um, uh, half of it, to, as a way of healing, sorry, take a few more minutes when you have question healing. I found it with, along with some surviving Cambodian health professional. We have so few of us uh, after the Pol Pot. We can't come in the fingers, uh, some of us survive. So I feel actually the, the first to come to America being licensed to practice medicine and pediatric medicine in uh, the state. So we founded this organization to conduct global health and mission and locally we try to do our job in advocating for Cambodian health in the community to uh, fill the gap and uh, have disparity. You know, Cambodians have some adjustment in this country. Uh, Naomi know PTSD is rampant in the Cambodian communities, you know, as of this and also intergenerational thing like that. And, you, you know, uh, doctor uh, over here from Santa Rosa, you know, yeah. And then we have medical mission, Cambodia is beautiful to visit. We have medical mission, anybody would welcome. We have fundraising to buy medication. 
we buy America, we sponsor, and we treat it. I just come back from mission three weeks ago, and uh, we treat like 5,000 people. We uh, surgical uh, operation 150, and we provide all this like, to just try to help a little bit. The infrastructure in Cambodia, everything is uh, so much fall behind. Uh, in Southeast Asia because of the history, come back to year zero, you know, so there's so much to rebuild. But the country has been, I think, have been different every year, right? I saw that it have been progressing with GDP growth of 7%. I'm not trying advocating against the, uh, for the government, but the people's life have been improved. The people, many, many million have been, have been uh, uh, put out of the poverty, have from, uh, you know, gain the middle class, you know. So many class, but the gap is so so wide. The rich are filthy rich, so like everywhere, you know, to drive any uh, Bentley or something like that, Mercedes, thing like that, Lexus, and the poor live one dollar a day on less, you know. So you see, so so bad situation in Cambodia. Healthcare is so desperate. There's not so much hope. People still. Put a smile despite nothing. Having nothing, they still have a good smile on your face. So that's what makes their life so much. Our experience over there is so worthwhile. We have so so much here, and we should not complain. So, so, thank you, thank you. You have any question, everybody? Is this some something about our mission? Okay, you can ask question. Yeah. Question. Over here. Yes. Over here. Oh. Yes. Over here. Yes. Yes. <laughs> So I want to go back to 1975. I actually have multiple questions, but I'll constrain it to one for now. My question is, at what point did Cambodian people who weren't part of the Khmer Rouge start to realize what was happening? And was there any resistance at all? Or, or if, if, if people went along <coughs> Was it because of ideological reasons, or could you, could you talk about that? Yeah, 75, 17, April 75, <coughs> everybody was taking it back because we didn't realize the, what they're going to do, okay? Even me, I said, oh wow, why they do that? Why they could save us to work like slave for them? Why they don't want us? A lot of people were duped by them, so, so a lot of them, their policy, they ask your CV, what you do, what you do, some people high, high, high. Some are a little bit kind of naive, they tell them the truth, hoping that they can take them back to work instead of, you know, evacuate them. Some soldier naively tell them, oh, I'm a soldier general, I have this skill. Some I'm a, this, I'm this skill, and it all took them to, death, to die, to slaughter them. They didn't realize that. You know, I think we didn't expect that to happen. This thing, evacuation, why you evacuate us? You know, they're paranoia. So the, I think the way is the virus spread us everywhere so that we not organize to, again, to fight against them, to struggle. And that's the way you spread you everywhere. You have no resistance, no organized, no organization, no organized resistance. And the people, Cambodian, being Theravada Buddhist, all believe in fate. Fatalistic. You go there, Cambodia, fatalistic. I'm poor because that's my last life. I do something good this, this life for the next life. Cambodian are like that. We've been faulted, you know. There's a lot of discussion about the culture. Khmer, Khmer period. Cambodia was a glorious period. And they say because of the Hinduism. Hinduism. Buddhism is too passive, they said. Except, just accept what you deserve. And I think the people would not resist it. I cannot believe we didn't dare to organize. But you have no choice. Since you live in a village, you are not allowed to go anywhere. You, they spy on us everywhere, just like pineapple eyes, you know. They, I cannot believe, I couldn't, everywhere, and they ask me to go next day, I always dreaming about seeing my family. I my family, hoping to see them. I, I say, at that time, the provision of freedom is so, you realize freedom is so precious. You gotta take freedom for granted. I can come from San Francisco tonight, to, from LA to here, oh my God, like that. Over there, you can do nothing, just one kilo, two kilometers. Freedom is precious. Freedom is nothing you can replace. You cannot go anywhere. You have no way to fight against them. They slaughter you everywhere. But them, I didn't realize they slaughtered between themselves as well. 
their struggle, you know, they have power struggle in there. That's why in 1978, a lot of people joined them. They've been duped into and they die. They slaughtered. One of them, the Kahunam, his PhD, a PhD, he joined the Khmer Rouge. He's progressive, leftist, or something like that. Just like Kim Song Pong progressive. And he was there and differ a little bit in mean to build a country. He was put in prison and slaughtered, uh, killed. So he just summary slaughtered like that. I heard tell. They asked another group, they call a uh, society in Cambodian, that means your your chain of command. If, for example, I appoint, appoint a provincial officer, and the provincial officer, their lineage, the province, every, uh, your subordinate, your district, your villager, you they appoint them, that guy, they accuse the traitor, they kill the whole line of their assignment with their family. They kill all of them. And that's why I think their regime would not last like that. I, I was there in the countryside and I saw some poor people. I said, I guess their opinion. Even the poor people don't like that kind of regime. I said, how can you survive if the poor people don't even like you? But if we actually go on, I think Cambodia would be zero and I would die everybody right if it weren't for the Vietnamese intervention. Actually, this is very controversial. Also, the Vietnamese invaded 1978, at the end of 78. And then that's why I was free, actually. Without the Vietnamese invasion, which American opposed at that time, right, because of geopolitics, I would probably not here today. So people would not resist it. I don't know a lot of factors, okay? Yes. From, uh, we've had Long Moon speak. Who? Cool. The young woman who wrote the... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The, for the Kim father. If, yeah, first they came. Oh, he came, she came here? Yes, and oh. also we had a young man who is gone back to Cambodia and is teaching the, the music that was lost. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, Nimpon, Simpon. Yes. So we've had people come. Wow, that's good. They were very... Uh, mm. Regularly. Mm -hmm. One of the things that struck me was um, I was told that in Cambodia, if you wore glasses, Mm, yeah, exactly. It was assumed yeah, exactly. that you had them because you wanted to read. Exactly. And if you wanted to read, you mm. were educated. Mm, yeah, exactly. It's a sign of knowledge. So that's why I took away and I throw away my eyeglasses. I would not wear them. You know, Lung, all those people, I know some like her, her perspective from a child. You know? That's why in the outset I said I'm the age, 26, and educated. Uh, uh, college student, medical school. I threw, I went through all this period. Actually, demonstrate like everybody else went to demonstrate. The day they overthrow Pol Pot, uh, overthrow Siano, I was in the demonstration. Oh my God, with all the, the people, young people, you don't know anything and just, uh, I like that. I was there with all of them in during the movement in Cambodia, in doing the Pol Pot, uh, doing, you my age, you know, you guys, 18, 20, 21, 22, 23, you are very aware, you are very curious, your country is in at war, everything going around you. you I would be very curious, I read Newsweek since 1973, 74, I already read many things going on the war. First they killed my father, she's very famous now. Uh, you know, my friend too, very famous. A lot of people ask me, write book, but I'm not famous. You know, write book, nobody gonna buy it, you know. Everybody have their own story. Each uh, Cambodian have their own story. I would validate their story. Everybody have their own experience, and uh, so they are different. Everybody different, more or less. So very few family are untouched. Very few places and many of us. When I come back to Phnom Penh, 79 Jan uh, March, the first way to come back to Phnom Penh, the city was ghost, like a ghost city. No people, wow, all the houses no occupied, nothing. And I said they mentioned probably one, one third, so why, or not even that, you know? And the, the, all the houses are full, the Khmer Rouge, they just gather all the TV in one place, and the bicycle in one place, everywhere, they, how they organize it. And no people, not too many people live in Phnom Penh. They just gather, they live in the countryside everywhere, you know? And, that's the way they do, you know. So, a lot of people are duped into telling their right and their, their real identity, hoping that they've been called to work for them. Their only hope is work for them. 
as a slave, not to be put in hardship in a in a field, countryside, starved to death. But they killed. They were killed. You know, so no resistance. I couldn't believe no resistance. It's not possible anyway. You know, at that time, uh, people always oh you resist like that. They all talk. They all talk very resentful against them because they they just talk. And that's in the border in Thailand. They do nothing. They just talk. They dare not do anything. You know, where we are in, country, in the country style. I wish the war is over at that time. I, care, I say, actually at that time I was suffering so much that I don't really want to leave anything. It's better to, to die. But still a glimmer of hope. That means hope just hang on, hang on. And suddenly the Vietnamese invited and I survived. I said, oh, I have a new life a new life and at that time point on I said oh I have to be careful now be careful about my life I have to talk not to talk some people die at that time expressing their pleasure of the, uh, their defeat and a lot of uh, people die and again uh, I will come to a refugee camp we at the, we, we in Kawitang in Thailand and people tell their story it's just amazing everybody they have their own story everybody uh, just give me chills Everybody give me this story. One story, for example, I, I know one guy, he was being killed and then he tried to escape. And he said, he just floated in the Mekong River at night time, float the whole time, go to Vietnam. The whole time from north. And in the daytime, would be spotted, right? He just get up and go to anywhere, for it, get something to eat and just hide everywhere. And during at the time, the Pol Pot, in my village, say, oh, we have enemy, some enemy intruding. Had to be careful. I didn't realize what's going on. That's how it happened, thing like that. And he just flew himself and tried to survive. You know, when he, I always want to escape, but I say I would die and never gonna make it. Go inside the country, walking, no ammunition, no ration. I would die, and I was not at that time good at direction. You know, you would die. So only a few people who are in the border, on the border. They are successful in escaping to Thailand. There's some some of my friend who you know who one friend he's he work in the White House. He escaped. He's very successful. He's successful in that. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody have any question? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know that good question. Everywhere, every step of the way, they ask your CV, your CV. Oh, what your CV? And some people would not, uh, would not tell them, lie to them. Okay. So I tell them first of all, I'm only a peddler, thing like that. I'm a, I'm part Chinese Cambodian, part Chinese Cambodian. I'm a little bit more fair complexion. So you have to tell them a little bit kind of. A, Good lie. You <laughs> have to be a good liar, you know? No, I'm just a student, a peddler, and you just have to repeat your line all the time. If you say you are educated, very educated, then you can done. So, I have to be consistent. I, by myself, I have seen family, okay, who have extended family and their kid, or somebody tell them, oh, they are like this. Some, they go back to their own village, which is a big mistake. Go to their own village and they say, yes, this family is government officer, they die the next day, you know. So uh, some parents, I you know some family, their parents being reported by the kids, innocently. The kids don't know, you know, oh, my dad was like that, like this, and they die. So it's a good, at that time, you have to be very street smart in knowing the situation. He would ask me, the Pol Pot, hey, Mo, uh, you. What do you think a country with money and without money? Which country, which system is better? <laughs> oh, with money is better, you're dead. <laughs> you have to go to their long line, you know, that's no money, okay? Oh, would you believe American go to the moon? You say, yes, you die. You have to know what to respond, the, the mindset. They, everything is CIA. You believe in something American, let's die. You die, that's it. So they would test you. You sit there and they are low level, but they would tell the high level people, you know. So liar is not bad, I think, for your survival. Sometimes 
I think, I don't know, my Christian values, you shouldn't lie, but lie in this situation, you are forgiven, right? I think, I don't know, what's the Bible, <laughs> you know, so. So I have to lie when you are like that, you know, you are not lying for anything but for you to survive, you know, for your family to survive. Yeah, I come back and no, no. Uh, I have, have only one brother who escaped earlier and he was here. And the rest in the country, no. So, actually, everybody has suffered a little bit PTSD, myself included, you know. During the early age, I think 10 to 15 years, uh, here I would have nightmare every night, or uh, more, very often. At night, we're being thinking, oh my God, I'm being caught again by the pot pot. I live uh, during the nightmare. I would get up and say, oh my God, no, no, it's not true. You know, things like that. So, you know, cherish your freedom here. Yeah. Freedom, you never, when I come back and I'm in refugee in the Sunday school, I heard a story about the James John. I said, why people do, would do that? The James John story, what people go there and be in prison. In San Francisco, I was there. They put people like that, you know, so amazing. And us, we are forced to live in a labor camp and just, just incredible. I don't know, some, uh, I cannot tell you how have to be some movie like this or something like that in the green fields in that thing some of the event or the scene in order to tell the story my kid last year my kid your college age or now almost 30 30 something and then they all tell me the kids my kids suddenly have interest in me <laughs> my story go back Last year's 40 year anniversary, especially, tell ask me what happened, thing like that. So, my daughter, even her friend Ariana Grande, which is she, she go with. She said, "Oh wow, your dad," thing like that, you know. So, even her, I interested. Yes. Are you religious after going through the genocide? Am I religious after genocide? You know, I pray for God during that time a lot. I pray for a lot at that time because one day they took me and I thought it's going to be my last day. I always, you know, we are Buddhist, so uh, I'm still the same. <laughs> Actually, people have resiliency, okay, resilience. And I think some are resilient like me, very resilient. Some. Um, suffer so much they go into religion thing like that but for for i, I just normal you know still the same so, but i pray a lot to god to everybody to help to save me that day so i believe in some supernatural being that they might be there somewhere i don't know cannot prove it you know so <laughs> it doesn't hurt you know but uh, i was spared that day they asked me to go i was in a work place like that and they said come let's go my the cadre want you and they asked me and they tried to ask my past oh who are you like that somebody probably tell them but they didn't believe it's something so i was spare so many events like that spare you from being killed and i think luck being lucky too you know so life is like that being lucky being Please. Can you please? Before the Papa took over, right? Before the Pope took over, yes, I think majority of the people don't like the communists. And uh, American, uh, Guntadin, the ambassador said that, at the time I didn't know, but he said that 
1970, after the coup d'etat, Americans support Cambodia, the, Cambod the local government, but half-hearted. Support not really full. And if you are at that time, you are at that time, the Congress was very against it. The Congress got funding the war in Cambodia and Vietnam, want to withdraw. The public opinion was against it. You go back in that time, 1960 was very strong, and the Nixon administration came to power to the White House in 1968. And in the 70s, the Americans wanted to disengage from Southeast Asia, from Indochina. So Cambodia get into a war that Americans lose interest late come in the war. So Gunther didn't say that, oh, we support America, uh, Cambodia with a second rate weapon, only second world war weapon. He said that in his article, you go Google, Gunther Dinh, he, he say all the things I didn't know, you know. So the Cambodian government was corrupt actually, okay. That's just like a lot of government, they steal money, thing like that. And the country uh, defenseless against the uprising from the people. The people, the movement supported by Sihanouk was so strong and the government lose ground because there's nothing to fight and the Congress cut off the aid at that time, done, the government was done at that time. I think Congressional Act, Congress, you know, was against the war at that time. So in the Congress appropriate fund, right, you know, Congress cut off aid, no more aid. So Cambodia fall. But the Cambodian was resentful because, you know, you asked us to join the war late, but we still joined the war, but you left like that, promptly. I think that more have to do when, with the bombing. The bombing actually doesn't affect too much. Because at the last trial, people interview Cambodian people, say, if the bombing affect you, thing like that, they said not too much. I don't feel like that, okay? I feel like the cut off of the funding that put Cambodia to the uh, the pot, pot, you know, the, to the hand of the butcher, I think. See, a politics at that time, America was tired of the war. Cambodia should not get involved in the war, should not go. It was a mistake, I think, yeah. looking back. Yeah, I think. Dr. Todd, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah.